Hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar, Inside Costa Rica, Natural Wonders and the Plan to Reopen. We're very excited to be bringing you this webinar today where we're going to talk about uh, some of the ways that Costa Rica has been a leader, uh, both in the ecotourism world and also in the current uh, coronavirus pandemic. So um, we're going to talk about Costa Rica and how it's been a leader in biodiversity and ecotourism. We're going to talk a little bit about the uh, Costa Rica's response to COVID-19, um, some of the early response and protocols that have been put in place to help contain the coronavirus. Uh, how the travel industry is preparing to reopen and some of the evolving practices that are uh, being implemented as well. And we'll also look to the future um, and talk about possibilities for travel in the future. Uh, and again, we'll have that Q&A at the end. So with that, I'll go ahead and introduce our panelists. Our first panelist is Paolo Valerio. He is an ecologist, tourism entrepreneur and nature photographer. Uh, Paolo was born and raised in Costa Rica and has been involved with ecotourism since 1992. He has worked as a naturalist guide, a birding guide, and a field instructor uh, for several companies, and has developed and directed field study programs for the National Learning Institute in Costa Rica and for universities in the United States. Paolo graduated as a tropical ecologist from the biology school of the National University of Costa Rica, where he also worked in the soil and hydrology lab. We're also joined today by Mariana Garita Fournier, uh, she is the Tourism Management Executive of the Costa Rican Tourism Institute. Mariana works to promote the positioning of the country as a destination for cruise ships uh, by developing strategies to attract shipping lines, including the development of the FCCA Central America Cruise Summit 2019 in Costa Rica. Uh, Mariana also assists local tourism companies with the licensing process to obtain the Costa Rican country brand. She directs the production and development of audiovisual and support materials on preventive tourist security, and she coordinates projects that improve tourist care and experience in Costa Rica. Uh, we will also be joined by Marco Gasparoli. Uh, Marco is the manager in business development um, at Salva Verde Lodge and Reserve. He has been with Salva Verde since 2016. Prior to that, he spent 15 years working with hotels and tour operators in the Costa Rican tourism industry, coordinating the operation of cruises in various Central American destinations. He also worked as the Costa Rica and Dominican Republic destinations manager for the Hotel Beds Group, a branch of the UK-based TUI group. Marco was originally from Italy, and uh, before coming to Costa Rica in 1990, he sailed around the world and worked with an Italian hotel chain and travel agency before coming to Costa Rica. Uh, last, but last, last but not least, we're joined by Andrea Holbrook, President and CEO of Holbrook Travel. Andrea joined the team in 1993 and has been the President and CEO since 1998. In addition to her role at Holbrook, she also supports the work at the Holbrook-owned Salva Verde Lodge. And uh, this was a place that was her introduction to the hospitality and travel industry. Andrea is a board member of the Setup E Conservation Learning Center, a nonprofit organization that is closely linked with Salva Verde and that connects communities with conservation through education and ecotourism. Yeah, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Paolo. Paolo, thank you so much for joining us today. Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, or whatever you are around the world. Um, my name is Paolo Valerio. Uh, Lindsay has already introduced me, so I'm in charge of an introduction to Costa Rica's biodiversity, explaining why the country is what it is so special nowadays in terms of its uh, position as a worldwide leader in terms of conservation and ecology. So without any further delay, I would like to, to give you a real quick explanation of what makes the country so special in this regard. So this is where we are. As you can see in this uh, world map, you can see that the position of Costa Rica between two gigantic land masses, North America and South America, in between the Atlantic and the Pacific, or in this case, the Caribbean, gives us a rather privileged position. For the biological diversity being in, in between two huge land masses, it's, it's terribly important. The ecological influence of both continents has been tremendously important. And being in between two oceans gives us a very interesting climatic diversity. So the territory is very small. It's uh, 19,653 square miles. That means that the territory of Costa Rica will have more or less the equivalent size of the country of Denmark, or in order to make it more familiar for people in North America, will be about the same size of the state of West Virginia. 
And that represents only 0.34% of the total continental area on the planet, which means, literally speaking, Costa Rica is a speck in the world map. But this speck in the world map contains more bird species than the combined territories of the United States and Canada. It's going to have more um, species of plants and trees than an area twice the size within the Amazonian rainforest. There are more animal species in Costa Rica than in all of Western European countries together. More species of butterflies and moths than in all of Africa, and more species of bats than in any other country in the world. I could brag about my country for a week, but that's not the point. Basically, keep in mind that when I say small, I, I really mean small. The longest diagonal you can trace in the country is of about 300 miles. And the narrowest point in between two oceans will be a little over 75 miles wide. Interestingly, the country is not flat. So that means that there are a lot of mountains in, 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 on the way, which makes traveling distances a little bit longer than people would estimate from just looking at a map. In any case, diversity is a key. When you're studying any type of tropical ecosystem, and most specifically the case of Costa Rica, you must understand the concept of biodiversity, which basically means the number of species per unit of area that we are talking about. Now, rainforests happen to have the highest biodiversity from all land species on planet Earth, which means there are more species per unit of area in our tropical rainforest than on any other kind of land ecosystem. And as you can see, there's plenty of rainforests around the planet, but quite a few of those, like the ones that I'm showing over here in the Northwest country of North America, and in certain parts of Japan and in Asia are not exactly tropical. So tropical rainforests themselves are in fact restricted to an area that is less than 20% of the world's surface. Yet, in this little equatorial belt, you find more than one third of all of the planet species. So this amazing diversity is triggered by a series of different um, aspects, of different phenomena. One of them, and the most important, is that in order to reach the surface of the Earth, the sun rays that are crossing the atmosphere at the equatorial area happen to go through less of that atmosphere than if they do so in the northern or temperate region, which means basically that the same amount of light in the tropics contains more energy than in temperate regions. And that in itself, it's amazing because it, it defines the, the shape of the trees and the whole structure of the forest. If the sun is a source of energy that is directly above, tropical trees are going to have that umbrella type shape that is going to define the tropical rainforest canopy in itself. So these forests are stratified and tropical rainforests are going to have layers of growth in which specific, completely different creatures are found in the canopy, in the middle layers, or even on the understory, which is very different from what you can see in temperate forests when the growth is actually the opposite. Our privileged position between two gigantic land masses, allowing the migration and the displacement of species and floras and faunas. The different climate patterns which are provided by different ocean streams and by different air currents, and the very regular topography of the country, allow us to have a great deal of different types of, of habitat which are known as life zones. A life zone is basically a biogeographic region with different uh, particular environmental conditions that allow those areas to support specific type of an ecosystem. So in little Costa Rica, it's easy to find amazing different habitats such as the incredibly beautiful tropical dry forest, like the cloud forest or montane forest, which are covering our highlands. Tropical rainforest, very lush jungly type habitats in the lowlands. Transitional forest, which are the overlapping of those ecosystems between one region and the other. Wetlands, incredibly important all around the world and even subalpine paramos located in the highest elevations of the country in which the conditions of temperature and amount of uh, UV light are very, very good. So because of that, our diversity is privileged. And I would like to sum this up by giving you a little bit of a comparative study. Let's talk about amphibians, for example. The country with more amphibians around the world, right here on the screen, just happened to be uh, Colombia with, three, with 583. Brazil has 516 species. And then um, here we have our friend uh, country Ecuador with 358. Little Costa Rica has fewer different uh, species of amphibians than the rest. The same is going to be happening with reptiles. Mexico is number one, 707 species of reptiles. Australia has 597. And here we go with Indonesia, 529 species. Now compare Costa Rica. Costa Rica is 
the 18th place in the world. We don't have nearly as many species of reptiles. Same happens with mammals. Here we go, Indonesia with 670. We have Colombia 648. And Mexico with 529. Costa Rica at 249 species is the 30th place in the world in terms of mammals. Plants, same thing. Brazil has over 50,000. Colombia over 45,000. And China over 30,000. Costa Rica a little over 10,000 is number 12 in the world. And last but not least, birds. Well, then again, Colombia is over 1,700 species. Then Peru with over 1,600 species. And Brazil also with over 1,600 species. Costa Rica uh, as a modest 23rd place. But hey, now let's analyze this comparing the relative size of the country. Whereas Colombia has 0 0.5 amphibians per square kilometer, Costa Rica has 3.5. Whereas there are 0 0.4 reptiles per square kilometer in Mexico, there will be 4.5 different species per square kilometer in Costa Rica. The same happens with mammals, 0 0.3 species per square kilometer in Indonesia versus 4.6 species per square kilometer in Costa Rica. And with plants, 6.5 species per square kilometer in Brazil versus 245 different species per square kilometer in Costa Rica. And with birds, 1.5 per square kilometer in Colombia versus 17 per square kilometer in Costa Rica. Because of the number of species we have and the relative size, what this means is that the overall biodiversity of Costa Rica happens to be one of the highest in the planet. And there are plenty of other species known as endemics, which are only found in the country as well. At a population of only 5 million, the country has a lot of interesting facilities. 5 million makes it very manageable in many ways. Uh, with the, all, the country also boasts, and we're very proud of this, of having the second highest literacy rate in the Americas and the third highest healthcare coverage in the Americas, which has made things very easy in terms of handling crises, in terms of providing the right mechanisms for communicating with the population, not only about the current issues, but about conservation and education in itself. Close to 25% of the whole territory is protected in one way or another, which has been a key component in the fact that ecotourism represents almost one third of the country's income. That being said, we are particularly keen of making sure that we are doing everything we can in order to protect this income for us. So it's been the country's major effort to try to guarantee that the national parks are not unattended that the tourism facilities are not unattended, et cetera, because we are pretty much depending on it one way or another. I know I'll be hearing from you a little bit more towards the end of a presentation, but I really wanted to give you this overall biological introduction before proceeding to the next part of the webinar. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm going to turn it over to the next panelist. Thank you so much, Paolo. Uh, at this point, I'd like to welcome Mariana Garita from the Costa Rican Tourism Board. Uh, welcome, Mariana. How are you today? Great, thank you. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity and Paolo for that great uh, explanation. And thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, well, today uh, I would like to um, give a little introduction of the Costa Rica Tourism Board. Um, it's an institution oriented to strengthen the Costa Rican sustainable tourism development uh, model by defining public policies and alliances and programs to promote competitiveness and sustainability in the tourism industry and in the country. Um, I would also, also like to uh, provide you an overview of how Costa Rica's uh, government response has been um, evolutioning in, in this, uh, to confront this crisis of COVID-19. I would like to uh, start with um, the date of March 6th, when um, the first case of COVID-19 occurred. Only three days later, on March 9th, uh, Costa Rica banned mass gatherings and all events. And later on, a week later, on March 16th, uh, the government declared a state of emergency uh, we, under which um, basically well, all of us uh, went home, uh, working from home, and schools and all non-essential businesses were, were closed. Um, also, on March 19, the country's borders were uh, subsequently shut, and uh, we still had some days to um, coordinate all tourist flights and get them back safe uh, home before March 19th. 
Um, so far, we have been receiving also um, humanitarian flights and repatriations for Costa Rican people. I appreciate your help. Thank you. Now, um, to um, let you know more about these details of what's been happening since then, Costa Rican government response uh, quickly, quick response has been uh, a key to to this uh, pandemic and to contain the spread of the virus. As of to date, uh, we have registered one of the lowest um, fatality rates in Latin America. And today, recently, we um, registered 1,000 uh, COVID cases and 64.6% uh, .6 of uh, patients recovery already. Now, um, I would like to go over four uh, key factors for this, uh, um, for this uh, way to respond to this, to this crisis. Uh, number one uh, key factor is uh, the free universal healthcare system that Costa Rica has. Uh, 71 uh, years ago, um, it was, there was a decision to abolish the army and this allowed the government to invest a higher portion of the GDP in this universal healthcare and social security system. And this allows us to reach uh, almost 95% of the population, which becomes a great strength in these days. Uh, as I said before, well, the inmate response of the government uh, taking um, the right necessary actions and a good timing is also um, one of the key factors to help us contain the spread of, of the virus. Uh, for example, we started um, with vehicle restrictions ever uh, since since the the lockdown started. Uh, for example, it was from 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. that we were allowed to um, or vehicles were allowed to circulate, and later on that restriction was gradually um, extended up to 7 p.m. and then to 10 p.m. For example. Uh, all these uh, measures, uh, actions, uh, were following all the guidelines and recommendations from the World Health Organization. And it's very important to remember that the Ministry of Health is um, the institution in charge of dictating all of these regulations and, and policies. Uh, uh, Lindsay, would you please? Thank you. Um, the next um, key factor will be a strong institutional support. Um, ever since all this has started, uh, all the government entities were uh, mobilized to respond to the pandemic. As an example, our national liquor, liquor factory um, switched its production to producing um, gel alcohol, mm -hmm. and the post office was in charge of distributing uh, these um, hand sanitizers throughout the country. They were also uh, helping to distribute medications to all patients who, um, um, all patients with other high risk and different disease like diabetes or high blood pressure so that it avoid uh, these patients to get close to a medical institution to get their medication. Another example is that universities uh, concentrated efforts in developing ventilators. The National Learning Institute uh, produced gear for hospital and, and healthcare personnel. And of course, the labor of the ministry, the role of the Ministry of Labor has been uh, very important, supporting um, an economic contribution given to those people who have been affected or unemployed by this crisis. And uh, counting on the support of the Congress also, who um, have been approving legislation very quickly, uh, helped us to um, applicate all of these emergency sanitary measures, uh, relaxation of labor contracts uh, to avoid layoffs and tax reliefs for all different types of industries, including tourism in, in the country has been one very important measure. And uh, finally, I would like to recall the community response, uh, which has been amazing. All the community organizations hundreds of companies, private companies and foundations are being distributing, have been distributing food and aid to those families affected throughout the country. 
Uh, later on, on May 11th, the Ministry of Health announced this reopening timeline for us to get back um, to into the new normality, I would say, very gradually. On May 16th, uh, the Ministry of Health allowed 13 selected national parks to reopen at its 50% of capacity, pre-purchasing uh, tickets online to avoid lines outside of the parks. Um, we were, I believe, one of the first con uh, countries to um, reopen or allow the football games uh, with no spectators and any other non-contact individual uh, recreational sports. And also, a small hotels were um, allowed to reopen at its 50% capacity. This is a very important measure for our industry since 87% um, of all rooms available in the country are um, representing these uh, small hotels. Uh, and beaches were allowed to are still allowed to open from eight, from five to eight a.m. during weekdays only. Now, what we expect for uh, the month of June is the remaining national parks to reopen in stores. We have in total twenty-nine national parks, uh, public places, and other parks, museums uh, to reopen. Also, we'll be able to reopen on June first, and uh, the rest of hotels and um, one. Important information here is that border closure expires on June 15, but these may be extended. So we'll make sure to communicate all these official information that comes from the Ministry of Health. Um, later on, by June 21st, we expect the rest of commercial activities to, to reopen. Cinemas, theaters, and religious centers, and bars, as you can see, and finally, or hopefully by uh, middle of July, uh, we will count on protocols for schools to reopen. But so far, um, private schools have been teaching online and public schools also um, have been providing all classes online. Um, beaches will be also um, allowed to, to visit with social distancing. I believe this uh, social distancing um, has been a basic measure or a golden rule for everyone here in Costa Rica, uh, respecting the six feet um, separation from other individuals and also from other social bubbles has been uh, a key activity and measure for us. Now from um, the side of the, the tourism board, um, we have, um, designed a roadmap to recovery. Uh, this is a plan, a roadmap, like a living document. It's uh, something really flexible, uh, but we have designed some initiatives in order to uh, recover, in order for the industry to recover. And this has been in conjunction with the private sector, with um, experts from every uh, type of uh, business in Costa Rica, hotels, car rental companies, uh, restaurants, travel agencies, um, marinas. We've been working together at this roadmap and the major issues are, well, protocols for tourists to enjoy the country once reopened. Uh, health is our top priority right now. And uh, we've been uh, designing these protocols also in conjunction with, with uh, the private sector experts and the Ministry of, of Health, of course. We've been uh, in contact daily with um, airlines to keep up to date, to um, kind of monitor when they will uh, return to, to our country. Uh, also promotion in our priority markets is an important uh, topic for this roadmap. Um, Essential Costa Rica, our country brand, has the understanding of what is um, essential to life, to our families, nature, surroundings, and reconnecting with ourselves. So we will continue enforcing this, this measure, measure, message through, through this crisis, or once we can reopen um, our borders. Um, another important factors here are uh, the reactivation of companies, the training that we need to provide to all the workforce involved in tourism industry, 
and uh, for, for all the, the companies involved. Uh, we're trying to make sure that every um, touch point and from start to end of tourism activities is covered and is safe for people to, to travel. Uh, this roadmap has not uh, been finalized. As I said, it's a live-in document, it's flexible, and um, it's um, subject to change according to the Ministry, Ministry of Health directions, um, also subject to airports and other sector functions. But the ICT is, is working um, very close to all of these um, experts in the private sector to, to um, overcome this situation. Um, finally, um, I would say the, fine, the main actions of all uh, travel agencies and tour operators for reopening um, lands on these 14 protocols that we have designed um, and issued by the, the Ministry of Health. Uh, these 14 protocols are um, specifically for each activity. We have uh, designed pro protocols for hotels, which, which was the first one to be published, for um, adventure activities, for congresses and events, for transportation, water transportation, for marinas, and so on. So that I, would, I said we can cover all these touch points and, and create a safe environment for everyone to to travel. Um, there will be a collaboration with the tourism industry to support one another in every step of these, of the phases that we um, will face. And also, well, we have managed uh, the COVID lockdown the best way possible in a way that reflects the fundamental values of our society, uh, democracy, democracy, peace, protection of the environment and sustainability, and also the well-being as a way of life. Uh, basically, the Pura Vida lifestyle that characterizes as Costa Rican. Uh, thank you very much, Lindsay. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Mariana. Andrea, do we have uh, Marco joining us? He, uh, Marco has had uh, a little bit of difficulty with the weather. Apparently, there's um, quite a storm where he is um, in Costa Rica right now. So um, I am going to um, see, Marco, are you able to, he, he told me that he's on, he's messaged me, um, but I'm not sure that he's able to speak. Marco, are you there? Um, I think he's not there. So I am going to do um, a, uh, is there a picture of Marco there? Sorry. Um, I'm not sure that we're hearing him. So um, I, I think that um, what we can do is I can jump in here. Um, and so I, Many of you who are in the audience probably have been to Selva Verde Lodge and um, if not are looking forward to going to Costa Rica and exploring the rainforest uh, and many of these wonderful ecosystems that Paolo has been talking about. And thank you so much, uh, first and foremost, Mariana and ICT for supporting us in this uh, presentation. We really do appreciate that support. And I know that many that are in the audience are, are really eager to find out um, you know, how Costa Rica is handling the opening and um, how soon they can go. So um, one of the things that Mariana was referencing in her presentation are the protocols that the ICT has put forward. And as she mentioned, one of the first protocols that came out was for lodging and accommodations. Um, so I'm just going to go through um, some of these guidelines um, that are part of the disinfection and cleaning protocols um, and prevention of COVID-19 that have been given to the hotel industry. So next. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go through um, some of the methods and, and cleaning agents, um, staff hygiene, guest rooms and, and bathrooms, uh, public areas like office reception and public spaces, um, as well as uh, restaurants, um, kitchens and cooking and suppliers. Next. 
Okay, so um, in, first in terms of cleaning and disinfection, um, there, um, there's a, this is obviously a very condensed version of a pretty long um, uh, protocol process, but essentially it's the idea that cleaning always precedes disinfection because they're two very different processes. Um, so it's about uh, removing um, uh, organic matter and dirt and then proceeding to destroy bacteria or viruses um, by uh, physical or chemical means. Um, the physical uh, plant and furniture, um, it needs to be done um, in a very methodical, scheduled and continuous process. Um, and there's also a tension, um, you know, noting the fact that you want to minimize um, aerosols and so dusting needs to be done in such a way that there's a straight pass and there's not a lot of shaking or sweeping to minimize the aerosols. Obviously gloves and masks should be used uh, whenever handling um, these, um, the waste. Um, so, um, there's a focus on, we're very fortunate to work with um, various providers um, that uh, provide um, different um, disinfecting agents basically um, that are against emerging infectious viruses and the coronavirus. Um, I won't bore you uh, with too, too many details. Um, as you can see, there are, um, it, the the protocols that Selva Verde has um, uh, go into details about um, dilution and mixes and different um, chemical agents that must be used. This is just an example of what those are, but um, they are absolutely part of our um, protocol process at Selva Verde. Next. Um, so this is just about our staff and hygiene. Um, so um, there needs to be um, time and means for hand washing, hygiene, um, and frequent disinfecting throughout the workday as well as the elements of the workplace. Um, staff uh, has to have appropriate gear, gloves, masks, um, and uniforms. Um, and um, obviously daily there needs to be um, a clean, you know, clean, clean work clothes that are uh, available and provided um, and worn by the staff. Um, and the administration provides and guarantees the use of, of PPE by the staff according to the guidelines of the Ministry of Health. Next. Um, so something very important about uh, guest rooms and bathrooms, knobs are disinfected um, because they're high touch um, surfaces according to the policies. Uh, bed linen wrapping towards the center to avoid production of aerosols, um, sheets and coverings and cloths uh, bought, um, brought to the laundry area at once. Um, washing with um, certain solutions that I referenced that are antiviral and antibacterial. Um, guest beds cleaning with a cloth impregnated with dis, uh, disinfecting solution so it just permeates beyond um, the, um, the actual sheets itself but goes into mattress covers, etc. Uh, floor cleaning um, with certain disinfecting agents um, as well as protocols for draining the buckets um, and avoiding using uh, dirty water to spread more germs. Um, and then uh, obviously um, the bathroom, um, the bathroom disinfecting is very, very important. We've certainly read about that in the literature and it's in the protocols um, and it has to do with, um, again, dis use of disinfectants and, um, um, and different substances that are required for, um, you know, in, in certain in dilution percentages for cleaning. Um, next, um, so again, public spaces, office reception, um, handrails, doorknobs, keyboards, touchscreens, um, desks must be uh, disinfected frequently. Um, disinfection by spraying surface areas after five minutes of using a microfiber or cloth in the common areas, having gel um, available uh, and disposable towels, making sure that uh, personnel have PPE as necessary, avoiding the sharing of pens and disinfecting um, after use if they are shared, and um, establishing social distance of um, the 1.8 meters equivalent roughly to six to 10 feet excuse me, 
and cards or keys must be um, uh, that are provided must be disinfected um, upon departure, um, etc. So next. Um, for office uh, uh, continuing and office and reception in public spaces, um, uh, for luggage personnel must have um, authorized protective equipment to handle the luggage, um, avoiding contact and manipulation of belonging of guests, visitors, and suppliers. At the welcome, inform guests of the procedures and the regulations in place. And if a guest uh, presents symptoms related to COVID-19, it needs to be communicated immediately so that treatment uh, promptly can be guaranteed according to the Ministry of Health guidelines. The Ministerio de Salud, sorry, that's a acronym there in Spanish. Um, restaurant, uh, kitchen, and cooking. So staff must be symptom free and carefully monitored. Uh, obviously, um, there are hygiene standards for um, staff um, about makeup, jewelry, etc. Um, for better hygiene. Um, and then at the restaurant, tables disinfected every time a customer leaves and before disinfecting, again, the removal of, of dirt and debris. Um, and um, leave dis the dis disinfectant spray needs to work for a period of five minutes before it's wiped clean. Um, and then um, a little bit more about storage and preparation. So about um, clean, dry, ventilated areas for uh, storage. Um, containers covered and clearly identified, products on shelves or pallets separated from the floor, um, food refrigerated at certain temperatures, frozen food as well, meats placed in containers or plastic bags, um, defrosting the thaw for meat, chicken, fish according to the standards um, that the protocol sets, um, wash and disinfectant un disinfect unprocessed vegetables, greens and fruits, and work tables are washed and disinfected after using raw fruit food. Um, and then finally, um, suppliers must comply with the cleaning and disinfection measures. The use of PPE is requested for um, the care of products within the suppliers. Um, and security team must keep a record of the supplier of the suppliers with the date, time, and person. Um, the stay in the establishment, um, they are, they're only allowed to stay the necessary time and hostel, hotel um, staff should clean and disinfect reception area after a supplier visit. So this is just really um, boring, um, but, but it's important for you to see, I think, what just one property um, and all of the properties, as Mariana was saying, have been given these protocols. But there are, um, I believe she referenced 14 different protocols that apply to transport providers. Um, you know, activity, adventure activity providers that apply to spas and thermal areas. So every every element of the supply chain is being given protocols and trainings uh, with webinars and, and other um, educational sessions in order to, to do this kind of uh, prevention and disinfection. So this is just to give you an idea of, of what the industry is doing to prepare for, for um, the lifting and the reopening. Great. Um, so I think um, now we're going to move on to just a, a last comment a little bit about um, why Costa Rica is a good option in the post-travel era. Um, so Lindsay, I don't know if you want to pull up that slide. Um, so I don't need to reiterate um, just the things that Paolo really covered very well in his presentation about um, the biodiversity and the tremendous um, natural resources that the country has. But just, um, I, think, I think it will be a go-to destination because um, of the fact that it is tried and true um, in the tourism industry. You know, Costa Rica, the importance of tourism in Costa Rica is something that you really feel as a traveler. And so um, whether it's through how many people speak English, the well-prepared, uh, well-trained uh, staff, um, and the just incredible naturalist guides um, and drivers and uh, that sort of um, 
resource is, is really unique to Costa Rica. And um, I think that it will come in a tremendous good stead at, at a time when people are looking for um, a sense of safety and security. Um, the fact that it's got the small scale tourism, as Mariana mentioned, over 80, I think it was 87% of properties in Costa Rica are actually 20 rooms or smaller. Um, and many of them are surrounded by nature and, and quite, um, you know, uh, a sense of, of, of well-being in, in that you are not, um, you know, in amongst ton, tons of people. So that's another reason why Costa Rica, um, you know, in the post um, COVID-19 situation, or in you know in the early the early opening stages, I would say, and then finally, um, Costa Rica's health system. Uh, Mariana alluded to that. Um, it's actually, according to um, the World Health Organization, has a slightly higher life expectancy than we have here uh, in the United States. Some of you may be from outside of the United States, but uh, it is 36th um, in in terms of all the countries. Um, it has a you know, a higher life expectancy than so many other countries, as I said. Um, it um, has four large private hospitals, um, including the Clinica Biblica, Catolica, uh, CIMA, and um, it is a, even a destination for medical and dental tourism. So um, you don't have that sense that um, if something should happen that you know, you might be in a position where you, you won't be, you know, able to be treated, that quite the opposite. And then just, um, you know, when will it be safe to travel? I, I know that um, um, you're all hoping, as we are, to have um, that, the answer to that question. And I, I, I don't think we have a definite answer, but um, at this point in time, um, we know that June 15th, um, international um, borders are currently scheduled to reopen. Um, that could change. That's, that's, that's not um, set in stone. Um, we know that um, commercial flights, uh, a number of carriers have already requested permission to begin. Uh, United Airlines has requested flights uh, to start as early as June 16th. Um, Copa Airlines um, is currently on track to begin flights between Costa Rica and Panama on June 26th. Um, we just saw a schedule from American Airlines with a tentative date of July 3rd. Um, these are, please keep in mind, these are dates that, that must be tentative and flexible, but it says, it's, it says good things about the progress that's being made, um, that, that things are, um, looking at, we're looking at June and July dates at this point for commercial uh, airlines. Um, it's, it's difficult to know when, um, you know, what the process for entry uh, will be if, uh, like Iceland, for example, has already said that, um, you know, people that passengers will be able, passengers arriving will either have a two-week quarantine or will have a test um, uh, upon arrival. Um, so I think at this point it's, it's um, you know, in the next few weeks, I think, by mid-June, we'll start to see many countries starting to declare what their process is for re-entry. But um, we hope that we've given you a, a great insight into Costa Rica's management of COVID-19 and just a taste of why um, Costa Rica is going to be a great go-to destination as things start to open up. So I, I will stop there and I'll leave it um, uh, to uh, to the audience now to to share their thoughts and questions and insights with us. Wonderful, thank you so much, Andrea, uh, and thank you again to all of our panelists. Uh, as Andrea mentioned, we do have some time uh, available to answer some questions. So if you have not already submitted a question, you can do that using the Q and A panel uh, at the bottom of the screen. Uh, as we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. We do have everyone's microphones muted for this uh, webinar today, so unfortunately we won't be able to take any uh, audio questions, but again, we encourage you to submit those typed questions and we'll share them with our panelists. Um, so I guess to start, um, one of the uh, questions that people have asked about are about the uh, procedures that are in place currently, and I'll put this to either Paolo or Mariana, are uh, face masks uh, required to be worn in public currently? Um, thank you, Lindsay. Well, it's a recommendation from Ministry of Health. 
um, in terms of uh, the protocols that uh, have been designed for tourism activities. Um, it's also a recommendation that the tour operator or the um, company provide uh, mask and, and personal uh, equipment to, to the people um, arriving or the travelers. Um, but it's a recommendation. Okay. Uh, that leads to another uh, similar question. Someone has asked uh, if, uh, I guess this is directed to Andrea, uh, if Holbrook Travel will be supplying PP, P PPE if travelers lose theirs or if they don't have them uh, when they arrive uh, or things like hand sanitizers. Good question, um, and I appreciate that because it gives us a clue where people are, you know, what people are thinking and wanting. Um, we have been talking about um, providing masks um, for those that, you know, might not have, might have lost them along the way exactly in that circumstance. Um, and um, so I would say that it's a, it's a, it's something that we're considering um, and um, we will take that as a recommendation. Great, thank you. Uh, I'll pose this question to Mariana. Um, when, do you know as far as the timeline for re reopening the airports, uh, will the Liberia airport also be open or is it the plan to open San Jose initially? San Jose only, um, I should say. I, I believe initially uh, San Jose. Okay. Uh, we haven't received uh, confirmations for, for flights uh, to, to Liberia. Uh, but they are both working together, developing uh, the protocols required for airports. Uh, let's see here. Um, has there been any word from the Ministry of Health about what kinds of procedures will be in place for incoming visitors to, as far as screening, um, especially people coming from places uh, that have high exposure threats? Will there be a quarantine required? Has anything been determined uh, from that point of view? And I'll put that to Paulo or, or Mariana. Well, since it's in uh, progress still, the, the protocol we will follow uh, also international guidelines. So, um, so far we will need uh, the protocol to be approved by the Ministry of Health and, and issued so that we can have more information about those details. I okay. may add a little. Uh, one of the biggest concerns that we have been um, dealing with is precisely that: is is the um, the question whether visitors are going to be quarantined or not, because we truly understand that traveling and uh, going through the process of getting in the plane mm -hmm. and going somewhere else just to be confined to a specific spot for a number of days until you're clear to go out. Um, makes travel extremely uncomfortable and it is certainly uh, something to be considered. Do I really want to go abroad and take the time to travel to another country just to be restricted or quarantined? So we truly understand in the tourism industry that that is definitely a major problem. So that is why we are not taking things lightly and deciding immediately what is going to be happening. What I have been hearing from the Ministry of Health and from the Costa Rican Tourism Chamber and others is that we really need to assess the development of the virus progression, not only in Costa Rica, but in the countries from where we're getting visitors from, in order for us to establish a, a method of screening at the airport, which is effective, non-invasive, non-intrusive, and most importantly, that guarantees the safety of everyone without having to confine people to quarantine for X number of time. So I guess everything that, uh, that is going to be implemented will be depending on how the the virus transmission progresses in the next uh, in the next few weeks, not only in Costa Rica but everywhere else. Great, thank you, uh, Andrea. I'll put this question to you. Um, we have someone who'd like to know: um, Do we have an idea at this point how group uh, ground transportation may be affected uh, going forward? Um, I. I feel like it's a little bit early. Um, certainly the guidelines and the protocols um, have been uh, handed out, as I mentioned. They're one of the 14, the set of 14. Um, and I, um, to be very honest, um, have not had a chance to delve into those. Um, we certainly have talked about um, lower density in the vehicles um, and having something where, you know, seats are, um, 
skipped, for example, to provide greater greater um, space in between uh, participants. Um, but I don't have specifics on that. Uh, but I think that is really coming next, uh, for sure. I think that's vitally important. Of course, um, when you consider the fact that you do need to get into an aircraft in order to travel to Costa Rica and go through airports. Um, you know, your um, that is, a, you know, another issue. And currently, many carriers are not selling the middle seat uh, in order to provide, um, you know, greater distance. Um, so we'll have to have have some review of a what the protocols are and b what we we can do at Holbrook to do this uh, effectively. Great, thank you. And another question, uh, sort of on a similar vein, Andrea, um, is whether guides uh, will be given any special training on handle how to handle groups in the field. Um, that is a good question too. Um, so um, of the list that I saw. Um, I, uh, of the 14, I did not see one specifically for guides, uh, but maybe Mariana can help me there. Sure, um, it's not um, issued yet, but uh, I believe we're working on that also. Um, it will roll out uh, probably soon, but not, not published yet. Great. Yeah, if, if I made the National Association of Tour Guides, it's independently beginning to work on that. Uh, they are, will be conducting meetings with the government authorities pretty soon upon the request as well, because they are also want to make sure that they are covered and protected as well as their clients or participants in the programs are. Uh, there are several institutions in the country which are now interconnected dealing with this. Um, precisely about the previous question, the CTP or the the, the National Public Transportation Council has already issued a series of requirements for public transportation. Because tour buses fall within the same category, they also need to comply with those. Except the tour buses have a tremendous advantage, which is that they are usually operated with far less capacity than the public transportation service. So with tour guides, what is being happening is that they already have some, uh, the, the licensed tour guides already have the, uh, the knowledge and how to handle the groups under certain circumstances and crisis management is one of the things that they need to cover within their training. So we're just basically waiting for the, the um, official statement from the government in terms of uh, the distancing, the maximum number of, of participants per group and what the requirements are going to be on that to be implemented in the field by, by our highly trained, I must say, professional tour guides. Great, thank you. Um, another sort of similar question, and, and Paolo, I'll put this one to you. Um, is there any kind of safety net available for any uh, people in Costa Rica who are currently uh, unemployed uh, in the Costa Rican tourism industry? As a matter of fact, yes. It's one of the, one of the great things that we have been able to witness, and um, both Andrea and Mariana have mentioned it uh, before. There is a government strategy, which is called the Proteger program, which um, is extending bonuses for people who have been affected because the tourism industry was completely paralyzed up to 100%. Anyone within the tourism sector can apply to the Protejer bonus, which means that they are getting both um, uh, economic assistance from the government in terms of a financial aid, and at the same time, they are also getting access to food packages and other things. I have been in contact with a lot of my fellow uh, tour guides and, and tour providers, and they most of them applied for the Protejer bonus and they're also doing a few other things successfully. So at this moment, we are still holding, the, holding together and there's a lot of solidarity among us, helping, you know, trading and doing all, all sorts of things as well. Thank you. Um, let's see, well, we're getting close on time here. So I'm going to uh, probably just wrap it up with one or two last few questions. Um, we have a question, uh, as to whether there have been any native species in Costa Rica uh, that have been determined to carry COVID-19. And I'll open that up to the group if anybody knows the answer to that. Yes, I, I do know the answer. Up until right now, there's absolutely no solid evidence uh, in terms of any, any transmission of COVID-19 um, from wild species into humans or 
it, it, amongst wild species. So at this moment, within all of the tropical Americas, the only known vector for COVID-19 is us homo sapiens humans uh, through our actions. There's been no evidence whatsoever of species being affected by it, carrying it, or transmitting it into humans. Great, thank you. And um, I guess I'll wrap it up with one final question. Um, we have someone who'd like to know, in addition to traveling and staying at Selva Verde, is there any way that people can um, make donations to support some of the valuable resources or, or destinations within Costa Rica um, if they'd like to show their support uh, during this time? And again, I'll, I'll present that to, to anyone who would like to answer. So I, I guess that um, despite the fact that um, our guides do have access to the program that uh, Paolo mentioned, which is Proteger, um, many of our group leaders, that's, you know, that's, you know, very small compared to what they're able to earn normally. So, um, I don't know, it's worthwhile thinking about. It's certainly a group that we are very sorry, you know, that has been so, so heavily impacted by this. Um, and I'd certainly be willing to, um, you know, to pass on for anyone that would like to, um, to, to pass something on to the group of guides that we work with. Um, and there are a number of excellent organizations in, um, in Costa Rica that uh, do accept um, donations for both social and environmental causes. Um, I don't know, Paolo and maybe uh, Mariana, you might have some ideas. Uh, sorry, I know the, the Association of Tour Guides of Costa Rica um, which is covering several chapters which are more regional, for example, uh, the Association of Guides of, of Manuel Antonio, the Association of Guides of Sarapiki, etc., uh, could be help out channeling these this, uh, uh, donations, either they are, uh, you know, uh, monetary or if they are, you know, for food assistance or whatever. What I can do is that I can definitely um, commit to um, provide the contacts or to help people get in touch with the leaders or the presidents of these associations in case that there is an interest so that it is directed to the to the best possible channels without having to go through a lot of bureaucracy and and, and you know um, dissipating the effort through, through through many different layers so going straight to the source which will be those associations where people can contact their members and you know channel the donation more more appropriately so i can definitely send that up to, to Lindsay and to Andrea, so you have the information available. Great, thank you. Like, likewise, um, likewise, we would like to, to send Andrea uh, more information about this association and foundations uh, to receive uh, donations. We are aware of some of them related strictly to tourism um, businesses as well. Great. Maybe we can send that out. Um, um, Lindsay with the recording. Yes. Okay. I'd Absolutely. also like to just acknowledge um, Eric Olson, who uh, had a very good point about um, the fact that my presentation was, was in fact very focused on um, surfaces, um, surface transmission and eliminating surface transmission and that um, there's certainly um, a lot of evidence to show that um, it's, it's, very, um, perhaps there's a greater danger, let's put it this way, or certainly needs to be addressed about uh, people to people. So, you know, people in, in relative proximity to the other in terms of talking, um, speaking, you know, singing, whatever. So the particles that can be suspended in the air and an encouragement to, to really look at, um, you know, masks, distancing, and particularly with respect to transportation, and then checking for symptoms. So these are all really good points. Um, and I just want to mention that um, for anyone that would like to send us their suggestions about what um, would make them feel more comfortable, or particular concerns that they have, this is a great opportunity for us in the, in the industry, you know, ICT and certainly Holbrook, and all of our suppliers are very eager to know uh, what um, what makes what gives you confidence for traveling and what would make the difference for you. So, 
we encourage you to send us your suggestions and ideas. Yes, thank you. Amazing. Okay, uh, before we wrap up, I will just uh, take one moment to uh, let everybody know that we do have another webinar planned for next Wednesday. Uh, I believe that that is June the 3rd. Um, and we're going to be actually speaking with two filmmakers, uh, Suzanne Damrich, I believe it's pronounced. Uh, Andrea, you can correct me if I'm wrong there, and Farron Watley. Um, they created a film, The Mystical Migration of the Monarch, uh, and did some of their filming uh, at the Monarch Reserves in Mexico. And so we're going to be having a discussion with them talking about uh, the monarch migration and talking about their film. And so we're uh, looking forward to that. So we'll be sending out a separate invitation uh, to uh, provide more details about that. So we hope you can join us uh, for our next, uh, our next webinar. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, again, we will be sending out a recording after the webinar. Uh, so if you missed any part of the webinar or would like to share it with friends, you can do that. Um, thank you so much again to our panelists for joining us today. We really appreciate you guys providing your expertise and insight and information. Um, and uh, we are all very much looking forward to uh, the day when we can travel again. So um, thank you for joining us. And thank you to everybody thank who joined you. us for the webinar today. Um, and with that, we'll wish you a good rest of your afternoon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.